It's such a honor to be with you uh, in the fifth year of uh, Gamification Europe event. I join in, in uh, physically and also the digitally. And such a honor that uh, I am part of this Metaverse panel with Roman Rakwitz and uh, Yu Kaicho, the two heroes of my career of also. They influence me too much. Let me introduce my... Uh, we got a 40 minutes. I really like to give this 40 every minute to Roman and Yukai, but just one minute I like to introduce myself. Uh, I am from Turkey. I'm representing GameFed Turkey uh, more than five years. And thanks to Yukai and Roman, uh, they, they, they've been in, in Turkey and uh, we are trying to separate the world of gamification and game design for purpose in Turkey uh, with a big community, one of the biggest community in the Turkey. And such a honor to uh, introduce uh, Yukai Cho. Roman Rakwitz, uh, to you guys. Uh, let me introduce first Yukai Cho, and I'd like to first uh, question, my first question is going to uh, about uh, Metaverse, but just himself. Uh, he's Octalysis Group president, and also he's a founder of uh, Octalysis gamification model, and uh, less, less times uh, for these days, he's a very good uh, focus on the Metaverse with the MetaBlock. Uh, startup and i like to introduce him uh, yukai welcome and my first question is going to be please introduce uh, and what does the metaverse mean for the gamification industry and what are the uh, opportunities for the gamification design experts great uh just checking if you can hear me yes clearly the sound great all right well since you asked me to introduce myself i do have some slides just on that so um, so again, I'm Yukai Chao, and uh, basically my thing is I started working in this field now known as gamification since 2003. So maybe one of the earlier pioneers in the industry, uh, known for creating uh, the Octalysis framework, which I'll show a little bit uh, in my in my 20 minutes or 15, 20 minutes. Um, and I've done a lot of my, uh, speaking and sharing of my framework at places like Stanford University, Yale, Oxford, uh, Google, Tesla, IDEO. Uh, and I've done so, uh, my design work through my design company, Octalysis Group. We've impacted over a billion user experiences. Uh, I think also from the other angle of the metaverse, et cetera, uh, what's relevant is I was the chief experience officer for Decentral and work and working with the co-founder of Ethereum, um, Anthony Diario. So we're, we're designing gamified uh, wallet experiences. And then I was also head of digital commerce and head of creative labs or HTC doing VR. And so that kind of goes into that question. Uh, a lot of work and stuff, but, uh, uh, but that kind of goes into the question of what is the metaverse, right? And I, what's interesting is that uh, everyone you ask in terms of what is the metaverse, they'll give you a different answer and all the time depends on the company they're working at. So if they are a virtual uh, VR company, they'll say, yeah, metaverse, is a VR environment you can explore, you can socialize, you can do everything you want uh, as if in the real world. So like uh, a digital twin, et cetera. So if you look at uh, Facebook slash Meta, right? And, and Vive, HTC Vive, they, they like to pitch that way. Now, sometimes if, you, if they don't have VR in their company, uh, they'll say like, uh, but it's, let's say it's a 3D game. They'll say the Metaverse is a 3D environment that you can explore and do all these things, but it doesn't have to be VR, right? And you're looking at companies like Fortnite uh, what not, or um, uh, yeah, for, for a variety of, of these companies. And then if you look at the NFT companies, they'll say, oh, no, no, it doesn't really have to be a 3D environment. It's about, you know, persistent ownership and interoperability uh, in the digital world and even connect to the physical world. And so in, in the Chinese saying, there's actually uh, a story about, you know, blind people trying to fill out the elephant. And, you know, when they touch the trunk, it's oh, elephant is like a snake. And people try to touch the legs, it's like, oh, elephant is like uh, a pillar. And oh, this touch the stomach, it's like a wall. And at the end of the day, it's all of those combined, right? But I think and one very important the, thing uh, that goes back to the gamification world. question <laughs> is that it all ties together into a engaging experience, right? Because just, just because you have the technology, you have the shell, doesn't mean that, it's fun, exciting, and engaging. Uh, I'm sure as, as many of you have tried the, in the early days of VR, you put on a VR headset like, wow, this is so cool. And then after three minutes, like, yeah, I, I, thanks. I, I think I'm done, right? Because there's no real engagement. There's no empowerment of creativity. There's no social influence. There's no unpredictability. So, so 
the all the technology enables a gamified experience better and that's what gamification is very important we want to make sure the experience is, is there not just the technology great i just wanted to uh, ask same question to roman too and uh, let me uh, again ask you roman uh, what does the metaverse mean for the gamification industry and especially the gamification expert like us uh, is there any opportunity and what is your uh, i know that you got great talk and great episodes and thank god that you started to com uh, contribute uh, english content finally not german uh, i love it <laughs> so please <laughs> share your ideas and introduce yourself to my friend thanks oh i think um let's we, we don't have so much time so i i, I skip the introduction part everyone who wants to know more go to romanrakwitz.de website or google something yeah you will find uh, i think most of the stuff um so um Uh, yeah, also for the English content, of course, I have to do that sometimes. And I'm sorry, I now I have not the slightest accent of English in my my my, my speech, but um, yeah, you have to live with that. Um, okay, Metaverse. So I, I'm totally with you, Kai. Yeah, he said, it, you ask different people, you get different definitions. And that's really interesting. And, and so for me, for example, the Metaverse is, for the first time, it's persistent. I think it's something that you can't switch off. It's there. Okay, it can go there and you can go out, but it's it's there. Um, the other thing is that it's it's probably it's it's about shared virtual worlds. So it's not just about one world. So it can become a metaverse by connecting all these different worlds. I'm totally with you. Kind of have a lot of discussions about that. That uh, it doesn't. Or I don't know if you have just said it as an example, or if you also the opinion, but um, it's it doesn't need to be VR or AR. Um, I, I, I think most of the characteristics that I really like, uh, that, that I believe Metaverse is bringing out, for example, Fortnite, you can mention it, is already providing, okay? The social connection, you are, you are talking to others and say, hey, let's meet in Fortnite and have a social, social event there. And so um, then another thing for me, Metaverse means that you have to interact with real people. Of course, perhaps there are also some kind of AI av avatars or whatever, but it's mainly for ma uh, real people to interact with them. And it fulfills a social foundation. So fulfills a social foundation, you have to interact with real people, it's persistent, and um, it's about shared virtual worlds. This is how I would define the metaverse in the first place. Thank you, Roman. I mean, uh, everyone talk about metaverse and couple couple of weeks ago, one of my friends asked me about how we can enter the metaverse. It was a very uh, a good question for me. It's very, they have any, um, I, they don't have any idea about that, but now is metaverse very popular in the community, like uh, buying stuff and um, selling stuff like that. But I think the metaverse real power is going to be a gamification in, indeed. We need more gamify experience about that. And Um, the, the key indicator uh, for Metaverse project, they everyone agree with that, the community. Um, one of the strongest community right now running by the Octalysis group. I like to ask you, Kai, about that too. Uh, so how we can create a good game, gamify experience for Metaverse platforms? Okay, so I'm going to share my screen again because unfortunately a lot of the things I answer has to be based on this, the framework I created, Octalysis. I'm almost yeah. uh, handicapped that way. I always have to show it. Um, but, but yeah, so this is the Octalysis framework. I'm not going to go into the details about what it is, but it basically breaks down all human motivation, eight core drives. Uh, what's important to answer the question is that out of these eight core drives, there's what we call white hat motivation versus black hat motivation. White hat makes people feel powerful in control. They feel good. But there's no sense of urgency to procrastinate. Black hat motivation creates urgency, obsession, some sort of addiction, but in the long run leaves a bad taste in the mouth because they feel like they're not in control of their own behavior. But it creates thrill too. And then left side, we call it it's extrinsic motivation, things you do for a reward purpose or a goal, but you don't enjoy the activity itself per se. So you just do it. Once you get the reward, you get the goals, you're done. Right brain core drives on the right, intrinsic motivation. So things you just enjoy doing to the point you're paying money. So this is the important thing. Now, when we think about creating a good metaverse, I think it's very important to move away from purely extrinsic motivation. I think a lot of people in this talk, in this conference has been talking about that. It's not just rewarding simple behaviors. It's actually making the behavior itself more enjoyable. And so analogy I give a lot is, let's, let's say uh, if you have a game and you say, oh, I'm going to create a really boring game. But if you play this boring game a thousand times, 
you're going to get rewards, right, and badges and points. That just makes no sense for a game, right? But you see that in a lot of gamification implementation. Like the desired behavior is very boring. And say, hey, if you do this boring thing a thousand times, you get rewarded. But what we want is we want those right brain core drives, the things that intrinsically make the activity more enjoyable, giving people uh, meaningful choices, autonomy, uh, self-expression, make it more social, whether it's collaboration, which is more white hat, or competition, which is more black hat, make it more unpredictable. There's always a surprising, delightful experience. And once you make the, the experience more enjoyable, that's when you think about, okay, if you do this enjoyable activity many, many times, then you will get growth, leveling up, progress, and all those things. So I think to, to make things short, that would be the answer for how, how do we make a metaverse engaging, make sure those right brain quarter 357 are at the core of people's behavior, not as an afterthought. Thank you, Yukai. And also, it, it was nice to see your uh, octalysis model again, too. And, and Roman, I mean, my friend, it's uh, what you think about this right now, it's very hype about buying and selling in Turkey. We love, uh, we love to be lending, land uh, renting and buying the lands and this kind of uh, stuff right now, but there is no experience about it. I don't know what is your uh, future uh, ideas about GameFi of Metaverse platforms? Oh, I think it's 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 always the same, right? We have a new technolo uh, technology, we have a new medium, and the people are trying to create new formats for them. And then, so the the easiest way to do that is to take what we already have in reality and see what's the easiest way to mirror that in the digital world. And uh, of course, with all the of also with, with all the other stuff going around in Web 3.0, uh, thinking about buying and selling is a no-brainer. And so it's, this is, of, and of course, also the brands, if the brands see, uh, think about, okay, hey, we want to be there. We have FOMO. Okay, we have to go there. So what's our business? Buying and selling. Okay, and so again, you have this kind of, of momentum that's going on there. I mean, that's always the same. Sometimes it's the start and then something else comes around. That's often the case, or from my point of view, in this uh, in the game industry, yeah, open games. So, for example, Fortnite. Yeah, you have this game, then you have stuff that's being sold there as a as a as a business model, and then other other let's say activities will be created around that. For example, the social foundations and that kind of stuff. Sometimes this kind of thinking, buying and selling, will destroy everything. I mean, look at the the typical social media platforms. There's a reason why we have Facebook, or oh, Meta, sorry, and then um, we had all these other platforms and all the other platforms had a chance because the buying and selling mentality on Facebook became so uh, annoying okay, that we had to move somewhere else. And so marketing then destroys, again, all these kind of social connections on the other platforms and so on. So we will see where it goes to. Okay, so but from my point of view and... Um, um, I would also like to to share the screen, perhaps, if that's possible. Oh, I can't do that. That's that's interesting. Or should it be possible? No, I think I can't do that. It's not. It should be possible. Does it, does it work now? <laughs> yeah, it yeah. Worked for me. Do you see you my screen to... here? No, no, no. Not if yet. if you no. try and share it, I can then put it on the screen. Oh, I tried to share it, but it doesn't work. Um. I don't know. Okay, it's not so important. Okay, <laughs> the point is, it's just it's just screen. So I can tell you, the point is for me, the metaverse is something that, um, and the beginning is one metaverse. Okay, so it's it's of course the biggest. So what Meta is coming up with, or Horizon, for example, is all the most famous stuff. Everyone is going there, and then we will have um, different other companies coming in, creating their own little worlds, the virtual worlds, connecting each other together all these meta worlds together and so you're coming around and so you can go there and visit them but of course the old stuff will stay there so we still have the classic internet and we still have the real world and from my, and, and and you will be everywhere okay you as a, you have an avatar in the metaverse you have your own digital uh, life or profile in the internet and you're doing your real life stuff and what i'm really fascinated about is that i think the, the making real world connections. So, so bringing everything that you do in metaverse and you achieve there, um, bringing back into reality and benefit there from, from there and also the other way around. From my point of view, this is what, may, what really 
has a chance to 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 succeed instead of, for example, what we have in the second life. I think that because we missed that in second life and it was, of course, the technology wasn't so far. I think the real world connection and the real benefit in the real world wasn't there. And so I, from my point of view, this is what what really was a was was a failure. And um, f- when we're talking about gamification, for me, gamification was also was always some kind of you're developing, you're creating a journey um, that's unfolding in front of you over time, depending on your decisions. This is what how I see long term or sustainability. Uh, yeah, long term gamification. You're going your way. You're developing. It's like in a game. Yeah, we love it to to go forward to unlock stuff and to unlock the journey and go the journey. And just by going the journey, this is what keeps us hooked. And, and we look back and see, okay, it's worth my time and so on. And I think as a gamification designer, and then if we think about that, we have this kind of connections between real world and virtual world, and we, have, we see it in a time frame as a journey, I think there lies a beauty for us to design, to mentor, to accompany these kind of journeys and to design them for the users so they can see, okay, I have achieved something. I've, I've progressed in the, uh, in the metaverse. And now how can I use or can I benefit from that in real life? And then I'm making something in real life, business progress, whatever. And how can I benefit from that in the metaverse? And I really believe that um, this is the advantage that we have. That said, and then I'm, I'm all finished. Sorry. Um, the disadvantage, as I think the challenge that we will have as a gamification industry, as participants, is if you look at most of our products that are coming out of the, uh, the gamification industry, I really, I, I'm not talking now about all the reward stuff, people know me, I'm not ranting about that. The point, in, the, the point is, most often we try to create this kind of game-like visualization in the real world. So that's not possible anymore because this let's say game-like visualization is already inherent in the metaverse. Um, and so I, I, I'm really looking forward or I'm interested in how, how we will, as an industry will overcome that issue or we will, how we will find other ways. But I think it's about creating the journey for the people that connects the real world with metaverse uh, vis-a-vis. That, that's a very good approach, Roman. I mean... Uh, metaverse versus universe. What is the connection uh, from metaverse to universe? Maybe that's a good uh, thinking about that. And and UI uh, has a um, metaverse ent- uh, company right now, and he's doing lots of talks about it with uh, for MetaBlock. And I'm very uh, excited to see what uh, UK is going to share with us with his experience. And I'm seeing him that he's already making some talks in uh, NFT summits and metaverse summits. So I'm a little bit jealous, let me say it this way, because I always see him as a gamification guy, you know? Um, but uh, please, Yukai, share your uh, experience in MetaBlocks with us. Yeah, so let's, let's start off with a, a, a deep research on you know NFTs itself, and I've been lucky enough to be invited to some NFT projects as advisor. They read my book, etc. So, and I realized what makes an NFT valuable are three main core drives: scarcity, and I think that's the main thing we, we don't have to go into. The dig, there's a scarce digital amount; it can be copied at infinite times. But then there's the idea of that meaning and pur- purpose. So, an, an example I give a lot is I have a friend in Denmark who owns a very rugged, broken couch. Uh, but he cherishes dearly because it used to be owned by Winston Churchill, and he believes Winston Churchill uh, is a war hero. So to him, it's immensely valuable, right, because of the meaning behind it. But of course, if he was the only person who has sees Winston Churchill as a, as a hero, then it's valuable to him, but there's no marketplace, right? And so if there's a community, which is the, the third part, uh, of people who all believe Winston Churchill is a hero, now there's a marketplace you can sell to someone else, you can sell to someone else. And so these are the three components. And I think a lot of times there's the meaning component missing in a lot of NFT projects um, and even the scarcity because they can just keep issuing more and more and more. So I started a project called Metablocks, uh, which is an NFT powered by real world places and real life memories. The purpose of this, what we ultimately try to achieve is we want to preserve all our precious memories onto the blockchain instead of on one single server, like on Google Drive or, or something that another company holds and they can shut it down, they can go out of business. But if it's on the blockchain, then it live, can theoretically live on forever. So, uh, so it's a combination between a monopoly game 
where you own physical places in the real world as NFT. So it's like, oh, this block in San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge. But in order to level it up, you need to um, you need to upload meaningful memories. And so, uh, I, in some talks, I talk about my game loop stuff. So. And this kind of goes back to that question of how do you create a more engaging metaverse? Uh, a lot of experiences are linear. You know, you get a badge, you get points, and it ends. Uh, games, even the most simple game, is a little more complex. Uh, I know I'm just going through things very quickly, but there's a lot of there's a lot of talks that talk about each one of these stuff. But this is my education platform, Octalysis Prime. Now, this is MetaBlocks, okay? So MetaBlocks is uh, is the platform to that has that that um, that engagement loop to, to make things happen. And one thing is I want to echo what Roman said in terms of it is more long lasting if it's about the real world, right? If it connects to real world. And I, uh, I don't know if this is going to offend anyone, but I'm not a big fan of the Ready Player One movie world where the real world is just trash and everyone spends all their time in this VR virtual world, right? I think it's important that this real world becomes more meaningful. And the goal of Metablox is really trying to create a beacon in the real world um, connecting to the digital metaverse. So what does that mean? Uh, let's say you have your digital avatar in the metaverse, right? You can go to any any worlds you want, and you have you can have angel wings and you can go to somewhere else. But you can go to a place in the real world and like a bar, and it says, oh, through augmented reality glasses or smart watches, like, oh, you actually have these angel wings from this game. That means you're a VIP member. Please come in for free. Or the other way around. Let's say if you want to get a special sunglasses for your avatar, uh, you can't just go somewhere in the virtual. You have to physically travel to, let's say, San Francisco, do to go to a location, and then, um, and then once you go there and check in there, then your virtual character will have it after. So I want to see that interconnectivity. I also want to see with the augmented reality, where you walk down the street and you can see everyone's memories show up, and their other NFTs, like their Star Atlas space shuttles hovering above, their bored apes peeking out the window. So I think there's a and <laughs> looking at the game was always complex, but it's a it's a rollout plan in terms of. You start rolling it out, and I think this is very important for uh, people thinking about creating platforms, NFT experiences, metaverse experiences. Think about what is the rollout experience, and how do things all interconnect together, right? It's very important to to understand. Like it shouldn't be, like I said, when we look at the the, the a lot of people think gamification is this, right? But in fact, it should be very intricate, interwoven. It should add meaning and purpose to people's lives. You know, they're they're uploading their precious memories. It should have uh, interesting gameplay. And so we add more and more to that experience. But uh, overall, uh, I think that's very important to uh, to do. I think the so we have the game. The game is interesting, engaging, and you know, asset value may or may not go up. That's the thing. But the key thing is we create this game mechanic so that people will want to upload memories to the blockchain. So it's an engine to drive this value of remembering important things. And we know um, in the real world, right? If you look at landmarks or historical sites, museums, the longer it lasts, the more valuable it becomes because a lot of NFT projects are just like, hey, let's get rich in three months. And those really just burn out very quickly. And we want to make something that that lasts, you know, that's something you can uh, share to your children or your grandchildren. By the way, this, uh, as an ending note, uh, this is World of Warcraft's game loop, right? And so uh, it's very complex, very, very crazy. World of Warcraft is one of the most successful games in the world. It was the first game in the world that made over a billion dollars a year. Uh, of course, I don't think any anyone out there should create a gamification project this complex. But the problem is that a lot of people will say, hey, Yukai, you know, I gamified my platform and it's as fun as World of Warcraft. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Let me see, what, what, what do you have? And when I take a look, it's literally like just this. And, uh, and it's like, well, you know, it, it don't have to be World of Warcraft, but it should probably be a little bit more sophisticated than this. And at least you should know there's a big difference between the two. So I think the, the advice out there uh, is understand how, if you're working on an NFT project, how to make sure there's scarcity, how to make sure, and more importantly, there's, there's a, a meaning and purpose. And with that, you can build a community that are passionate about that, that meaning. And then after you have that, then you think about creating that engaging game loop to, to make a good experience. Thanks, Yukai. Um, our last five minutes, maybe uh, we can have some great questions. Firstly, uh, I will going to ask you, Roman, um, for example, um, the, the good question, one of the good questions uh, from Albert, uh, he talked about the standardization and about the using the same avatar with the different uh, games, you know, using your Roblox, for example, uh, avatar in the uh, some 
uh, companies interview, some kind of that, you know? What do you think about this kind of uh, approach, standardization on the blockchain? Uh, great question. So first of all, uh, you can, I, no, I, I'm hoping, I'm waiting for uh, the time when you come into Germany, Munich. I want to be the landlord in your block uh, game <laughs> for Munich. Um, Munich is so, one, of my, one of my favorite cities in the world. Yeah, perfect. Um, so th to answer the question, um, the point is actually we are also working on a project um, where it's more like uh, we are using NF uh, NFTs as a dynamic an uh, uh, avatar. So the point is what, what can connect both worlds, all the worlds, all the different, so what, what Albert is, is asking, all the different metaverses, uh, the virtual worlds, all the different companies, and of course also your real life experience or uh, in the internet, in the classic one, the, the, thi the one thing that can connect everything, the least common denominator could be an NFT that you own and that has your own IDs, your own achievements, whatever, your own, um, uh, the stuff that you own, And you bring it into the different worlds to the different companies and the companies are reading your NFT and then changing because of what they read from your NFT. And so, of course, that can mean that, for example, you have an NFT, the NFT tells the program how your avatar looks like, what you have already achieved in a particular game or in a particular virtual world, whatever, and what kind of different skins, for example, you own. Uh, and, and so then if you go to different companies in the store in the virtual world or whatever, in different worlds, different context, um, your avatar can automatically change its skin because of the NFT who tells the avatar or who is the avatar and tells, okay, in this kind of context, uh, you have this skin and you decide, okay, I'm, when, if I'm going into the store from this brand, I'm wearing that kind of skin. And if I go somewhere else, I'm, I'm, I'm looking like a dog, whatever. Okay, so that's possible. So I think that um, this is what I'm really fascinated about. If you create a, let's, something like a dynamic NFT that grows with you and changes with you and owns your history in all the different worlds. And, and of course, then the context, the brands that are inviting you, that you're visiting, can read what you want them to read. Ah, that's also a fascinating thing. Can read what you want them to read, take this data, and then adapt to it. Um, yeah, however you want it. Great. Does that make you sense? Kai, yes, great. Yukai, do you want to add anything about interoperability and standardization? Question yeah, from Yeah, I think Albert. there's a good question about there's so many companies doing it, and there's a few issues. Well, when people say, well, everyone's doing an NFT or everyone's doing a Web3 project, you kind of want to see it as the internet, right? The web phase where everyone just wants a website now. And you know a lot of websites become nothing, no one goes there. But if you're the top 100 website in the world, obviously you become very, very powerful, significant and, and world changing. Um, but the thing is that the interoperability right now is people like to say that, but there is a thing where uh, it takes development work, right? To make sure everything is interoperable. Of course, with blockchain, it's more possible. Uh, but they said right now the incentive is that People just want to do their own thing as opposed to make it write code to make to adapt other things. I think over time this will change because right now we the technology is possible. Right? Before the technology was not possible, maybe there's APIs, but now it's possible. And when there's and when it happens, then in the future there's going to be alliances, partnerships. It's hard to have one asset be. Uh, available everywhere. I think that's going to that's going to be in the, the distant future. But you'll start seeing a lot of alliances, where it's like this this one NFT could could go through you know seven different worlds from ten different companies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and so I think it's still exciting thing, something that grows with you. I think lots of people have experiences where they spend all this time building an amazing game character just to grow up a little bit and move on and the game the, those thousand of hours just become nothing so if, so like Ramon said if uh, if that can grow with you uh, that would be amazing and another question from a good friend Bernardo I think uh, he likes to ask you both about what would you say the most valuable component of NFTs for the gamification industry I think uh, Roman go on I would say it's ownership and agency. So you own it and you live with everything what your NFT has experienced. So it, it's your history. And when we're talking about gamification, um, what I think what everyone knows is that it, it, it's great if you have something like a dashboard where people can see their history, see what they are capable of, what kind of resources they have available, whatever. The NFT can exactly be this kind of dashboard. Um, 
but now going with you in all these different worlds, uh, real life or metaverse. And I think that's that makes it such an amazing tool for gamification. Uh, that's yeah, it's, it, for me, it's still mind blowing. I, st I, I think I still haven't really figured it out. It's amazing. That's great yeah. from you, Yukai. Yes, I would on. totally agree with Robin in terms of that ownership empowerment. And in, in our MetaBlocks discussions, we talk about, oh, what if people upload memories that are not safe for work, like right? gory, whatnot? Uh, you know, what can we do? It's like, well, we cannot just take away their NFT because literally it's theirs. It's in their blockchain. It's controlled by their wallet. We, as an admin, we, we can't remove that. That's the whole point. You fully own it. No government can take it away from you. No bank, no MetaBlocks company can take it away from you. What we only can do is say, well, we control the MetaBlocks.co platform, right? So those memories won't show that your, your blocks are delisted, but it's still in your wallet. You can sell it, your blocks in OpenSea if you want. We can't, we, the only thing we can control is what, what it shows on our website. And I think that is a very empower, uh, empowering thing about uh, blockchain overall. And another question from our community, actually, Doan Jam. Um, there is a word like, you know, the mass uh, employment, you know, like a QR code or other stuff. You know, which industries do you think uh, will you need more gamification design and going to be norm? We will see the metaverse uh, solutions, uh, Roman. Um, uh, that, that's a, pff, how about that? As of first of, I think everyone who's already struggling with gamification in the real life that won't be better and easier in the metaverse, and probably the ones who are already thinking directly right now, hey, we can use it for buying and selling. So the, these companies or brands that want to go the direct way, the efficient way. And so for them, it will be the most complicated way to think in a, a differently and to say, oh, it's not about the result anymore. It's about the journey to the result. And they probably, they don't, they are not patient enough. Uh, but I think that's the basic of gamification. Yeah. And I, I'm going to give a, a slightly dif uh, different answer here. I think the, the metaverse gives you different types of opportunities to be successful. Just like some people in the physical world, right? Maybe they're, even in the early days, right? They're not physically strong. They don't run fast. They suffer a lot. Then you have some technology jobs and then they're, okay, they do it. And now sometimes they're not surviving there very well. They play games. They're amazing, right? And a lot of the internet jobs came around and people who are struggling with other things became good at that. And I think when the metaverse comes, it creates this opportunity of people who weren't very successful other places, but now let's say they're, they're just good at playing games. Now they can potentially thrive. Not everyone will thrive, but I think it gives you a new playing field and you have to, if you're hustling, you figure out the rules. Uh, can, even for gamification design, like uh, make no mistake, like right now, I think 70% of the projects Doc Palace's group is working on is like some kind of Web3 project. Like he, they're just showing up and say, hey, we want Web3, we want Web3, we want blockchain, we want all this stuff. And so this is a big trend. I think the industry is recognizing gamification is a big core on it. So I think uh, obviously, hopefully everyone increased their design skills, gamification design skills. Uh, but I will say that um, there's it's a, it's an explosion of opportunities and recognition of gamification because everyone see connects the metaverse to games, right? Uh, to fun social and games. Whereas before, it's like, oh, why should banking be related to games, right? That's kind of weird. But now it's like, oh, banking should be the metaverse because the metaverse is the future. And of course, metaverse connects to games and fun and social. So I, suddenly this metaverse is the, the bridge between a lot of traditional industries and gamification. Good point, yeah. Yeah. And also, I, I totally agree with you, Kai, about uh, if we, keep, we will bring the game poor gamification design to Metaverse, it's still a bit problem. And also the, the same security problem with Web 2.0 to Web 3.0 is the same problem. If you bring the same problem to the Web 3.0, uh, that will be another uh, problem. So I just uh, have go on with, uh, pete so i will take two more questions that's great because we already uh for five minutes actually and torsten asked about the, the metadata and images are mostly not on the blockchain right now uh, but on the other hand only semi-decentralized entities like ifps what's your thoughts about this roman um so what torsten is right from my point of view is that most of the stuff uh, that that's being nifted or when NFT was created out is on, for example, on your computer. So if you, 
if 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 there's the the picture that um um and then you delete it, it's gone. Okay, if, if someone has, so th it's a little bit difficult. But the point is, um, he's mentioning IPFS, and now I don't know you can perhaps you can have about if I if I think if I'm not wrong, IPFS is totally decentralized, because you have all these different servers. So I can now become a member of the IPFS network. I think the I and it doesn't matter anymore if I, I delete it or whatever. Um, so I think IPFS is the perfect example that, yeah, we can even decentralize, sto uh, decentralized store ring storage. Uh, we have decentralized storage. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, again, first of all, this field is very new. It's developing, it's changing new innovations coming out. So at any one standpoint, when you're like, oh, I figured it out, maybe next week, everything changed. So, so <laughs> always have that in mind when you're talking, there's no, there's no, like seven year metaverse expert in this world, right? Um, now with that said, I also believe that IPFS for most of the definition of it is fully decentralized. I mean, you could clarify because maybe you have additional knowledge on that um, in the sense that if you want this uh, thing stored there to be destroyed or removed, the network, the whole network has to be gone. It can't just be one single node that that's that's gone. So if it's one node, it's centralized, right? If it's like everyone has to be gone, then it's decentralized. Um, so so that's how we see it. And of course, right now there's the challenge is that uh, uploading uh, data to the blockchain itself in the current solutions are pretty expensive. Uh, that's why a lot of times, you know, that's why you see a lot of pixel art in NFTs, right? Because it's <laughs> low resolution. And then the beautiful ones is usually just the NFT is just a link to the beautiful image that's stored somewhere else on a more centralized place like like Google Drive. Uh, but I think there are new technologies coming out. Uh, ICP Definity, I think that's their vision to do this to, to be a decentralized storage place too. Uh, so I think over time these problems will also be tackled on and at, well, just like any technology, I think it'll be cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to do the same things on the blockchain um, and and. Uh, you know, more things will be viably decentralized. Thank you, Yukai. And uh, one of my uh, Turkish uh, friends, I asked about him to write a metaverse book. He's working on a metaverse actually. And he said, if I wrote this book right now, it's just next week you have to throw away because it's going very fast right now. And I'm not publishing any book, my friend, he said to me. So I just, uh, I totally agree with you. So another good question from a uh, good friend, Gustavo uh, Tondello. Uh, he's, I, I love his uh, academic papers, uh, especially with the Andrzej Wachewski, another game question uh, grew. Uh, please send my love to Andrzej too, Gustavo. So his, his question about will the boundary between games and the general and the real world blurred with the metaverse, for example, if a game's economy in the blockchain, will it be harder to play just for fun? Because it's not easy to play with your money right now. Uh, real world consequences. You Kai will do start. I have to think a little bit about that. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> um, yeah, so we know in gamification, right, there's the over justification effect where something you just did for fun and now you get rewarded for it. And now your brain believes I'm only doing it for this money. So when the money's not enough, uh, I just don't want to do it anymore. And that happened with Pokemon Go, where you feel like, oh, I got all the Pokemon, so why keep playing and all, all that stuff? So we, we, there's tons of experience that uh, point to that psychology. So I think there is that. And, and obviously, Axie Infinity is one, uh, one of the most well-known cases. And they talk about uh, in the Philippines, you know, people just play this game and they make above average salary and they're supporting their families with it. And so I see all these trends about, oh, play to earn. It's amazing. You know, I even see communities that come to me and they said, oh, we want to do this thing called live to earn. You live at a community and you get and you get paid for it. Um, and I think there's two there's two parts that are important. One is that, yes, I think if you just see it as this is my main way of making income, uh, you will lose that passion. Right. Uh, I went on Reddit. I was looking up people who play X Infinity and they're like, oh, how much money uh, do you make from it? And they're like, oh, I'm still negative $200, but at least I need to play it enough to break even before I can quit, right? So they just see it as, so as, as a job, it actually is a very low, low weight job, right? Now, as a game, you would say, well, I played Diablo for a thousand hours and I got zero pay and I played X Infinity and I got $800. Yeah, $800 is amazing, right? It's much higher than zero, but if you see that sell, it's hard. Now, this works for some countries because of the exchange rate. So 
when you design economy, this is very important. There's a few things that run an economy, right? The, mo the most basic thing is a labor in, which means that if a person takes a thousand hours uh, on average to, let's say, get this, this sword or this weapon, right? And someone else wants to play this game, but they don't want to spend the same thousand hours. Then they spend that labor money. They pay you a uh, thousand hours worth of labor to get the sword, right? Now, it works great because in some countries, one hour of my wage is equivalent to 50 hours of your wage, right? And so I only have to spend 20 hours of my wage and I get your thousand hours of labor. So that's labor. There's also things like skill leverage, like some, uh, as your skill gets better, your the same time gets you more, just like uh, why, for instance, a doctor's hour is worth more than a janitor's hour, skill leverage. There's a the luck factor, which is like, let's say you play a game and you're lucky in the first hour, you get the weapon that on average takes a thousand hours. Now, even though you just spend one hour on it, if someone wants to get it for wants to get it themselves, they still on average have to spend a thousand hours. So it's still worth a thousand hours worth of labor, right? If they want to buy it from you. And then there's things like liquidity, exchangeability, all of those things. And so when you design a con, you really want to think about where that value is coming in because just because you have a coin doesn't mean it's getting paid. Like I'll, I'll end with a with a silly example because they're memorable. Let's say there's something called fart coin. I don't even know if there's, there really is this or not, but something called fart coin. Every time you fart, you record it and then you generate fart coins and you make money. So yay, fart to earn, right? It's amazing, right? But who is gonna pay you for that fart coin, right? At the end of the day, that fart coin, you're earning the fart coin, but it needs someone needs to exchange that for a carrot, right? Something in the real world, a proud produce or fiat money or another cryptocurrency that's worth fiat money. At the end of the day, you can generate all these tokens in the world. And it's almost like what they say, inflation, printing out more and more and more money. But the carrots in the world hasn't increased, right? There's no real production increasing. It's just currencies that are storing this, this exchange value going around. And as a result, you see general inflation. So I think it's very important to think about the economy value um, value creation when you when you're designing economy in the metaverse. That's a good point. So, so if you're creating the meme coin, fart coin, I will do it with smell coin or something like that. We can we can do that. Um, I, I, so nothing nothing much to add. I, I, one thing, perhaps I think, of course, every mechanic can can totally destroy it if you can make it too expensive, too hard to get into. Of course, that will destroy it for a lot of people. On the other side, it depends, right? So it can mean that for my little brother, perhaps it will be, it's not just for fun anymore because he has paid too much for his, what he owns, what he earns. So he's, he can't really sleep anymore at night, whatever. Um, if I do it, perhaps uh, it's, it's for me, it's really fun because it's, it's like play money that I had to invest to get into or whatever. Um, so if it starts like that. On the other side, um, I think with currencies, we see that on, on finance, decentralized finance has much more potential for people with less money to get into the game of finance uh, because cryptocurrencies can be divided in much more numbers behind the comma. And that, so that there's perhaps even more possible for these people to join than if it would be with real um, uh, pay to, to win games. Um, so there can be also a benefit in that. Thank you, guys. And uh, we got a, a Pete Jenkins question here. Uh, so, you know, Pete Jenkins, right? Can you remember him? <laughs> so I've heard of um, him before. <laughs> so his question about DAO, I mean, the centralized autonomous organization is a great potential for gamification, especially the uh, um, voting and the uh, decision on the organizations include the government, I think, the voting is kind of part of. So what do you think about DAOs? So I, I think now we are talking. That's interesting. Um, I called it agency. Um, I think the term that you uh, uh, said was better, empowerment. So for if if we are, for example, if we have uh, if if one of the the, the benefits on F NFTs is empowerment and ownership, the point is you are doing some. It's it's the same with NFTs. So it's all about communities, right? So communities have to find utilities. So NFT communities have to find utilities that make an NFT more valuable and not just as a collectible. And so DAOs, of course, have the potential to create that kind of utility because while you're contributing, for example, by going the challenges, by going the journey to the community, you're already becoming part or you're getting your shares in the DAO. And of course, that can, uh, that can be much more automatically smooth, easier, and so then you can you have the governance so it, yeah yeah by by 
interacting, you, you, you become part of everything, you can have uh, the decisions that being stored in your NFT or the rights to, uh, the rights to decide with it. And you can perhaps sometimes sell something out of that. Um, so I think the combination here and also to empower people and to let them participate in particular journeys or part of the journeys, DAOs can be amazing in that. Yeah, so uh, I think this also connects to another question uh, that's that's asked in the chat, which is, can an NFT own an NFT, et cetera, et cetera. And so, and this all boils down to that technology of smart contracts, right? And so a smart contract can run complex systems that just kind of run itself over time. And that's the, the thing about a DAO, right? And we talk about there, it is possible for just a purely non-human DAO to exist and generate income and do all those things. So let's say you have a uh, robo taxi model, right? So there's a DAO that controls cars that just people call it on the app. It drives you around. It goes to this place that robots, let's say, can, can, can service and clean it and then it collects money and it just keeps doing that, it just makes more money and use this money to, to clean itself and, and, and do this stuff, right? So that's like, so no human being is owning the money. It's just this DAO and robots and uh, just generating more and more income, becoming more profitable. So I think that is possible in terms of uh, DAO, uh, but I want to also clarify, you know, DAOs, I feel like, uh, and a lot of things is, is this way in the early technology, right? There's a lot of uh, idealism and, and vision about how amazing it'll be but I want to make it very clear that DAOs generally is not really democracy. And this is decentralized, but it's not democracy because um, usually the people who have the most tokens have the most votes, right? And so in this world, rich people would love to say, yeah, we have more votes because we're rich, right? But no, it doesn't matter how rich you are, you have one vote, which is democracy, right? And so this actually, the DAO is actually close to capitalism where the whales, the rich people have all the control. And so I, I want to just throw it out there just to just people realize that's the case. Now, of course, uh, people say, well, that's fair, right? That, that, you know, that goes back to the big debate about benefits of capitalism. It's like, well, people who put in a lot of effort, labor, put in a lot of, they, they put in money. Everyone else was like, they don't want to put in money. People who wanted to take risks early, they own a lot, right? So they, therefore, they have a bigger say. The community there. If it goes badly, they would lose more than everyone else. So, um, so I think that's there. But I think a DAO is useful because at least the rules are transparent. Uh, it's, you know, how people are rewarded, what happens. It's, it's very transparent, it's public. It's not just one guy saying, I don't like this. And so we're gonna change this still based on the voting and what, and, and the, the thinking behind why things happen needs to be published there. So uh, generally it's still better and you can see uh, a lot of guild design um, with DAOs be possible in the metaverse. So perhaps we should say that everything said here is not a financial advice. So <laughs> just to be sure. Yes, we don't know anything yeah. about finances. <laughs> but uh, our last question is coming from the, the Victoria. I, the, I met her with, in Berlin and she has great personality. I'm very happy to meet with her. So her question about, um, a question about curiosity, is Metaverse possible for vision impaired population, uh, Roman and Yukai? Go ahead. Yep. Obviously, first of all, I think none of us are pure experts on this this field itself. I'd say one thing that I'm really surprised is that in my education platform, Octalysis Prime, there is actually a, a blind person who's using it, which it blows my mind, right? Um, and and usually what what how they do is you have to label them correct with alt text. If you ever build a website and you're like, oh, why should I put alt text and images? It's because they kind of feel around and they click on it and they hear. Uh, what that is, and they finally figure it out and, and they interact with it. I think in uh, the first of all, the ownership stuff, right? It's a concept. People uh, can understand that and understand it goes from a place to other. I think it's it's the UI that um, is a challenge. But if they can go through the Octopus Prime Island, they probably can kind of figure out some of the uh, the wallet experience. Now, I think potentially they're, they they might be scammed more easily because they they might miss some important signals that it could be a scam possibly. So that's a dangerous thing. I think when we go into the actual like VR world of metaverse, um, I think it's actually really strong because the, the idea of VR is it's, it's a lot of different sensors, right? It's based on where your head moves, you hear different distances. And there's 
there's already a, you see that in the movie Ready Player, but I already see there's a lot of haptic gloves where as you grab something in the in the virtual world, it actually has a thing that pulls your hand back, so you feel like you're you're like you're holding a cup. You can't you can't close your fist because the cup is in your hand. And then there's the the uh, there's these haptic suits. Someone literally said at a at the um, at the uh, CES conference this year that they wore the, the the haptic suit and a demo, and they literally felt like they were stabbed by a knife, and the knife was twisting in their body, and it, it sounded kind of disturbing, right? But but I think with that technology, not with the disturbing cases. With the technology itself, I think uh, you can have more uh, more feeling in the environment. You can have better hearing. You know, people talk about having taste and smell uh, in the in the VR world. Um, I don't know if that will be a viable future or not because the economic use case of building this technology is probably relatively low, uh, but it's possible, right? So I think VR allows you to be immersed in a place that you can use all your senses, whereas your computer usually is mostly your eyes, sometimes yeah. ears. And I'd really have to add that um, the virtual reality departments so that are building this stuff, um, I have these are the departments that are really focusing also on sound engineering and how to use the, the audio uh, for to 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 accompanying all, everything you do. So it's not just that it's atmospheric sound, but everything yeah, for everything uh, sound feedback and so on. So they are, they are much more focused on all what you guys said the different different and. Um, um, Emotions? No, what is that different? Um, you know what I mean. Feedback possibilities um, than anyone else. And I think uh, I just take a okay with the P2. That was a great panel, uh, Yukai and Roman. Thanks to you. And uh, before the session, we just talk uh, with Roman and um, Roman said to me, you can ask this question, but please surprise me right now. I am going to surprise you, my friend, and I am going to ask you about your last uh, words to the community. And please add your best Istanbul moment in this your last <laughs> words, Roman. Let's go with you. What was your best Istanbul moment, my friend? And please send your last words to people. It's def you already said it. It's I've never met uh, such a flourishing community and um in in another country and uh, how how open they are and what they are doing and for example over this long term of period of time that's it's just crazy and um it's yeah it's flourishing it's amazing thanks guys yeah i think Thank the, you. the Thank thing you. that i was amazed the most about is the the central location of turkey and how it connects to so many different cultures they'll say oh this is the africa side this is the you know europe side i'm like what do you mean like you're talking about different continents oh like you literally connect to to all these places right and so you have this this very interesting cultural mix um and i and i really think your tour and just just trying different food with with you uh was probably the highlight um in terms of just the big takeaway i think um I, uh, what I mentioned a lot is when you think about NFT metaverse, like I said, there's a lot of opportunities out there and it's, it's just increasing exponentially. Uh, I'd say what's important is focus on the delight, uh, delightful experiences as opposed to the technology. Uh, you can have a bunch of technology, but people aren't happy when they interact with it, right? They feel unengaged. But if you, even if you have very little technology, Uh, if you're able to understand what makes people feel delighted and give them a great experience, they just want to go back more often. And that's where uh, true value comes in when people actually feel intrinsically enjoying uh, this new environment, this new world that you're building. And thank you. Thank you, Yukai and Roman. And thank you, Pete.